Are you okay? Yeah, of course. Are we? In- <laughs> I'm Wait. just getting ready for dinner. Are we? Are we? Are we gonna be okay for this? I can only speak for me. Oh. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Ryan Daniel Moran here. Welcome to Wine with Wine. It's about to get sloppy up in here. I'm joined today by the good doctor, Dr. Clement Wan, MD, DDS. Doctor, what's going on? I have none of those credentials, but <laughs> this, is, all good. this is the internet. You can have whatever credentials you want. Yes. This episode of Wine with Wine is sponsored by Costco. Costco, please send us free shit. Okay, uh, our favorite wine is a District 7, which we only find at Costco, correct? By we, I mean you find at Costco. That, well, I don't shop anywhere else, so, like, I wouldn't know if you could Why would you else. shop anywhere else <laughs> when you can shop at Costco? So, this is, this is our wine to beat. In terms of, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what is this, like, $16 a bottle? I think eleven ninety nine. Eleven ninety nine, and it's our favorite wine. Everyone we give it to loves it. District Seven. So this is our wine. This is our control wine. If the other wines we drink are shit, we come back to District Seven. You got mad at me earlier for not giving you water, so I'll pour you <laughs> the wine first. Oh, we. I didn't. I didn't aerate it. Is it? Does it still count if it's not aerated? All right, Doctor Clement, what are we eating tonight? We are eating um, sous vide chicken thighs with a lemon and uh, lemon and butter sauce. Sous, we're, sous vide chicken thighs. Yes. Explain to the internet world how sous sous viding works. Uh, sous viding is just I I think of it as like um, slow cooking on steroids. So at a very precise temperature, and you can never never overcook because you've got that very precise temperature. This wine's really good. Have you even tried it? No. I'm very impressed. This is good. It's the age man. Doc, uh, uh, Dr. Clement. Oh, sorry. Clement, not a Dr. Juan. What do you think of uh, Cassone or Cassone, as we would say in French? Or Cassone, as we would say in French. Cassone. Cassone. What is it in French? Cassone. How do you say that in Canadian? (laughs) Um... <laughs> what what is your what's your review on this? So here's my here's my caveat. I like my wines sweet, and I like them not sharp. Um, so relative to that, so you don't like wine, is what you're saying, basically. Um, so I, so like I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> wine with wine. Um, <laughs> um, I think this is freaking great. I think, yeah, it's it's for somebody whose palate is non-existent, it's drinkable. <laughs> Radu suggests throw some Pepsi in your wine. That'll make it sweet. <laughs> no, I'm, Coke drinker over I'm here. I'm no wine drinker, but I, that sounds horrendous. Speaking of Coke, we need to talk about dividend paying stock. Because Coke is a good one, and dividends right now, I think, are some of the most un- like undervalued asset class. Right, there are some really sweet opportunities in the market right now. I'm pretty stoked to talk about this. So stay tuned. We'll we'll have a session about dividend paying stock. I want to talk about business. We might talk a little bit about private equity, buying and selling companies. But first, let us pour our wine. Oh, that comes out nice. Well, got to rate it high then. <laughs> okay. Do you remember what the other stuff tasted like? This is a true split test here. Yes, I did. And this one tastes a lot more like vinegar. Does it? Yes. I think it's great. So I'm no wine drinker. I think it's great. But this is not what it used to taste really? like. Really? I can't tell a difference between old wine and... I can tell good wine from bad wine, but not old wine and new wine, apparently. What's the, that line from... Uh, 
a good friend of mine, Jesus of Nazareth. You pour wine into old wineskin, it bursts. And the camels and the eyes of the needle. <laughs> that's, a di- that's a direct quote, right? So you were thinking about becoming a pastor, were you? I was. I did go to school to be a pastor, yeah. Okay. Wineskins and camels yeah. are friends of the rich man. And... <laughs> And the meek shall inherit the earth. Excellent. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's a direct quote from yes. Mark 12. Yes, I'm sure you're right. I think, I feel, I'm insulted. You're religious, you're religiousist. <laughs> Hold on. Bring this dude on. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna hand you off to Ryan, but ask that same question but with less words. <laughs> <laughs> is this Daniel? This is Daniel. Daniel, I understand you're gonna ask me a question in as few words as possible. Very few words. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hey man, well, thanks, first of all, thanks for uh, let, let you know. Uh, let me speak to you for a minute here on a question, so I'm not. Uh, I like it when people thank me for letting them speak to me. Keep going. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we are, we are with, I'm with wine with Ryan, right? So it's, it's your show. Uh, in, indeed. So what's your question? Uh, my question is, how did you determine the niche that you wanted to serve? Um, I'm sure that you've gone through a lot of different places in business and how did you kind of determine the, the demographic and the people that you wanted to serve? So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, do you have a product up and selling right now or are you still in the evaluation process? I'm still in the evaluation process. I do some affiliate stuff, but I don't have my own product. Okay, that's a great sign. And this is a great question because people who buy affiliate products are also going to buy whatever products have your name on it too. So if you've got a blog, if you have a podcast, if you have a YouTube channel, if you have a website that sells things, whatever you're selling as an affiliate, it's time to go release your own product in that exact same space. Or at least to ask, who's buying these affiliate products and how do I get as many of those same people as possible? So do you have a specific demographic that you're serving when you're selling affiliate products? Not right now. I, I don't cater to any certain demographic. I kind of would like to maybe cater to, um, you know, maybe my own demographic, which is kind of like, you know, like middle-aged, younger male. So, you know, maybe like 25 to 45-ish area. So I, I think that's that's often a good place to default to, meaning if there's no one else within your sphere and you're evaluating between a couple of different products, choose the one that's most likely to appeal to you and your own demographic. But who is already buying the affiliate products that you sell? Um, I mean, it, it, it really varies. I mean, I, I don't really, I'm not really picky about what I promote. Okay, right what, is, what, is, what is your best selling affiliate product right now? It's a dating product for men. Great. So the question would then be, what products do men who are looking to date buy? And you could say men, and I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about straight single men, and we're not yeah. looking at married men looking for same-sex hookups, which would be a completely different market. I'm just going to assume for a second we're talking about straight single men who are looking to date females. What else do they buy? Do they buy fitness products because they think that getting in shape is going to make them more attractive? Do they buy make money products because being rich makes it easier to date in their mind? Do they buy products on persuasion or business? Do they buy clothes because they're looking to up their fashion? Are they looking for pickup lines, right? So there's a money angle to this. There's a physical product angle to this. There's a status angle to this. So all of these markets would serve the exact same demographic. So you've got your person. The question is, how do you want to serve that person? 
And that's a question about what assets do you have and how can you best help that person get to the goal that they want in a way that's better than all the other people who are serving that same demographic. Does that make sense? It does, Ryan. It does. Thank you. We have a we have a braingasm on our hands, everybody. <laughs> Daniel, to you by Dr. Clement. That's Dr. Clement gave us the braingasm. Daniel, anything else we can do for you? Uh, no, not right now, Ryan. I, I appreciate you letting me call in with this question, man. All right. Good luck to you, man. Keep us posted on your progress. Thanks, Daniel. All right. Thanks, brother. Brianna, how's it going, girl? Hi, Ryan. Hey. Great. How are you? Uh, well, don't forget about Dr. Clement. Oh, well, hello, Dr. Clement. It's a pleasure. Hi. So, so multifaceted in all of your specialties. Uh, apparently. Yes. Well, Brianna, what can we do for you? Well, I am curious about what successful businessmen like you look for in newer entrepreneurs that they may want to either partner with their business, invest in, mentor them, who they haven't necessarily built up quite an online presence yet or quite gotten ramped up in sales, but what characteristics they're looking for in people that they kind of want to help along the way and take with them. I'm not going to lie, Dr. Clement, I really thought she was going to say, what do you successful businessmen look for in women? And I was like, best question of the night. <laughs> you know, uh, so funny, funny question about this, Brianna. You can so, answer that question, though. You can answer that. I, prob- I, pro- I, pro- I probably will. Um, but, the you know, it's interesting, Brianna, is this happened to me, uh, what is today, Dr. Clement, as a gynecologist? What day is it? It's Thursday. Today's <sighs> Thursday. No, 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 it's Wednesday, it's Wednesday. Wednesday. No, totally, no, you were yeah. so wrong on that, yeah. <laughs> yes, the Bordeaux has kicked in, finally, <laughs> so it happened today, actually, Brianna, so I had a conversation today, I was on someone's podcast, and they got in touch with me because they, they messaged me, I didn't respond, so they messaged one of my friends, who didn't respond, so they found the friend of the friend, who got in touch with the friend, who got in touch with me. It is very, so earlier today, we had Santiago on Wine with Wyan, who did the exact same uh-huh. thing, who just hustled his way into getting in touch with me, right? They just, found a, they just found a way in a cool and ethical way to get in touch with me. Now, that is not what I'm going for here. I'm just looking. That's an indication of hustle right there. Now, the person that I was on the podcast with is sitting there telling me, about how he's releasing products to a very specific audience and how he did the exact same thing of getting in touch with these influencers. Couldn't get in touch with them, found a way to get in touch with them, messaged them until they responded, until he had equity deals with two million eyeballs, meaning enough influencers in that vertical, in that space, to where he now had an equity deal on the table with two million eyeballs. So influencers, one influencer had 500,000 followers, another influencer had 400,000 followers, another had a million followers. Total, about two million followers between those three influencers and he had an equity deal on the table. He had two products identified, enough capital to do a first order and that was it. That's the kind of guy that I'm going, I wanna back this person because they've shown that they can hustle in multiple ways to create relationships. This person is an action taker and he has some sort of proof of concept. The proof of concept isn't necessarily in the product, but he has distribution lined up. And my capital is going to be a lot, uh, is going to allow him to go faster. A lot of people are sitting and waiting on the sidelines, waiting for money to float down in the air, thinking that a mentor or capital is gonna solve all their problems. But a mentor or capital can only make things that are already in motion go faster. So I'm looking for the green button that says, if I push this, if I push this person, if I push this resource, if I throw money at this, it's going to move faster. It's that idea of if you're pushing a boulder down a hill, you can steer it, make it go faster, but it's really hard to get a boulder moving from a dead stop. So I'm looking for someone who's in motion, who has something lined up, and that by me getting involved, I can make it happen faster. Got it. Got it. She got it. it. 
Okay. <laughs> so what do you look for in women? Uh, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, you know what I look for? A pulse. That's, <laughs> that's the first sign. Yeah, that's, that's the first sign. That's I won't I won't date anyone who does who is who is not breathing. That is very wise. Yeah, I just find that those very, relationships very they're very one sided. The conversations have no depth when they don't have pulses. Right. Yeah. I mean, the depth maximum is like six feet. Mm-hmm. Goes like six <laughs> feet under. <laughs> Have some Dad joke online Wednesday. <laughs> my, my. Uh, Brianna, I like your style. Well, thank you, Ryan. I like yours as well. All right. So I'll, I'll s- work on my audience. Sounds great. I'll, I'll see you audience. on Instagram. Perfect. See you then. I have a confession, and I'm... I'm only admitting this because I'm drunk. Mm-hmm. I have not watched the last two seasons of Survivor. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. Guys, I've never, I had never missed an episode of Survivor. I realize you're Survivor Boy. Survivor Boy 13 or something. Listen, right? 35, <laughs> 35 seasons of Survivor. I never missed a damn episode. Never. Ever. You're not even 35. They, they have two a year. Oh, I've been okay. watching since I was 12. Since I was 12, I have never missed an episode of Survivor. 18 years I've been watching the show. Haven't watched it in two seasons. If that is not evidence, I have Survivor shirts from every season that in high school I wore every Thursday to remind my peers that Survivor was on. That's how much I love Survivor. Haven't watched it in two seasons because that's just a sign. If that's not a sign that TV is on its way out... Mm. I don't know what it is. And I'm, I feel bad about it. Like, I feel, I feel, I have a lot of TV to make up watching because I, I have to honor my own self image of watching Survivor. Ow, I, ow, hit my elbow. That's what I get for <laughs> Jeff Probst. The gods of Jeff Probst just hit me in the elbow and that hurt. Ow, I'm sorry. Perry Madison, Richard Hatch died last year. No, he did not. Somebody Google that shit quick. <laughs> did Richard Hatch die? There's no way Richard Hatch died and I missed it. There is absolutely no way. Richard oh. Hatch, deceased 2017. No! What? <laughs> when did Richard Hatch die? <laughs> what? Ha- what? No, I do not believe this. This is a conspiracy. I would have seen this. What? Are you a Battlestar Galactica guy? I am not a Battlestar Galactica guy. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? I think he was in it. What? Richard Hatch? <laughs> no, no, no. I need to see. Pull, Richard pull this up. Pull it. I need to see this. Uh, to oh, Will Henderson. Oh, thank God. Will Henderson saves the day again. It's a different <laughs> Richard Hatch, not the survivor one. <laughs> Will Henderson, you are once again my most favorite person on the planet. <laughs> oh, my goodness. My heart's beating like 160 beats a minute. Oh my goodness. Richard Hatch from Survivor, I'm so glad you're still alive. (laughs) Oh, tag Richard Hatch. He's got to have a fan page. Tag him in the replay, everybody. Oh my. Oh Oh my goodness. It's going to be okay. Season one winner of Survivor, Richard Hatch. I am so happy for you. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we have Lee Hammermeister. I don't believe you. There's no way we have a Hammermeister on the phone. I don't believe you. Lee, Lee, what's your real last name? Because I don't believe that it's Hammermeister. No, it's actually Hammermeister. All right, so I already know not to trust you because you're lying to me out of the gate. But what can we do for you? Lee, not my real name, Hammermeister. I'm also half Brazilian too, so you just never know. Half Brazilian? Do you have a sister? Yeah, that's crazy. You would have never <laughs> suspected. So no, no, you don't have a sister. Is that what you're saying? I uh, no, I don't have a sister. Only child. Wait, what? 
<laughs> Lee. Oh, that was funny. I got that. I got that. No, that was good. That was good. Okay. So the American school system produces a lot of workers, and it's pretty good, at, right? But with how we've gotten really close to uh, automating more than ninety percent of jobs, what are all those other people going to do after that kicks in and businesses become so efficient that they don't need most of those workers anymore? I and as entrepreneurs, what's our role in fixing that? I think that is a fantastic question. I'm chomping at the bit to answer this, but I've been answering the questions rapid fire tonight, so I'm gonna punt it over to the doctor. What are you gonna do when doctors no longer have jobs and uh, you can't perform colonoscopies anymore? Um, I dispute the premise because like every, every wave- Only a doctor would say, I dispute the premise. <laughs> Every wave of technology has brought with it a lot of um, a lot of chaos as far as jobs go, and we've like, in fact, the the whole definition in the term luddite comes from the fact you have people who were who were really upset about uh, the uh, I believe it's cotton mills, um, and or the cotton harvesters and the the job displacement there, um, and these people would destroy I, I believe it's looms um i'm sorry i don't know what a luddite is and i don't know what a loom is and i just feel <laughs> dumber within two sentences i have no idea what we're talking about anyway people keep on losing jobs with new technology and but we keep on creating more jobs than we lose and i think that with with automation you still get other jobs um, the service sector has boomed. Services and experiences uh, become more valuable. Uh, entertainment becomes more valuable. And I think that mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I think people have always worried that eventually we'll lose more jobs than, um, than we recreate. Mm -hmm. And until that actually happens, I'm not, I'm not going to be as concerned, but even if that's the case, that just means like we're becoming so wealthy um, and we can produce mm -hmm. so much that um, it probably also means that we have an opportunity to more easily take care of people. And Jake, Jake Hargrove says, talk about what you did with Aubrey, Ryan. Well, I can't disclose everything that happened with Aubrey, but we had a couple drinks. One thing <laughs> led to another. And uh, I was on Aubrey Marcus's podcast. Uh, he released it this week. And what I told him was never before in history, 100% of the time in history, every, cre every new innovation has created more opportunity than it has destroyed. One, there has never been an exception that, it, that a new innovation has, has not created more opportunity than it destroyed, which is why I don't fear AI. What it ultimately does is free up labor capital to go into other areas that'll be more productive. And I predict, your question was, we as entrepreneurs, what do we do? It's our jobs to be as creative as humanly possible and to be creating new things. Well, and to serve. And that's ultimately, a good entrepreneur serves and creates that value. So it's not creation for the creation's sake. Right, agreed, agreed. Although I think you will see over the coming decades that creative pursuits probably go up in value. Like creative things that you just put into the marketplace that will create cash flow over time is how people will thrive and have income on a regular basis. And you will have fewer and fewer nine to five jobs because they won't be necessary. And I need to go pee. All right. Badly. All right, gang. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us on Wine with Wyan. I don't know how to end this gracefully. See money. Say something smart. No, you say something inspirational. <laughs> something inspirational. Um, tonight's winner of wine. I get the vote because Clement is set on it being from Costco. But I'm giving the vote to the 2011 Red Blend. How do you say this in French? Casson. Casson is my vote tonight. As always, special thanks to Jacobson Salt Company for being the fucking goat. Special thanks to Costco for sponsoring tonight's episode. If you don't like Costco, you suck. Um, anybody else we need to thank? Special thanks to Aubrey Marcus. 
Um, uh, for uh, your crew, my crew, right? That's that. Well, the, now the, I look except like, for the one who quit. Yeah, the guy who quit before I could even <laughs> offer him a job. Wow. Special thanks to the crew for making this happen. Why are we thinking Aubrey Marcus? Special and um, and apologies for Tim Ferriss. Uh, we ran out of time to feature him tonight. Oh, thank the socialist. Yeah, well, we were well. Tim Ferriss oh, right. was going to stop by, and we just ran out of time. Thanks for watching Wine with Wyan. Well, see you when our livers heal. <laughs> so next Wednesday. I hope so.